MGTV, η ομογένεια κοντά σα. Education and Cultural Committee of the Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce. We have various events during the year, and uh, this particular event uh, will relate to a book presentation by Dr. Peter Moskos uh, on the third edition of the classic Hellenic American history social um, uh, book relating to the Greek Americans, uh, their struggles and successes. Uh, this particular book, uh, as I said, is a classic within uh, Hellenic American history. Uh, certainly it, it ranks among the highest uh, books ever written. Uh, the book was originally written by Charles Moskos, a uh, professor at uh, Northwestern uh, University. Uh, Peter is his son. Uh, Charles uh, is deceased. Uh, and uh, Peter has basically updated his uh, father's book and uh, brought some of the, uh, the current statistics relating to some of the issues that we, we discussed before. This particular book ranks uh, uh, among the uh, great works uh, from Salutos, uh, from uh, Dan Georgiakis, uh, uh, from uh, Canudos in the past, and from Contopoulos uh, more recently in, in the 1970s. So uh, we're very thrilled to have um, Dr. Moskos here to, uh, to make a book presentation tonight. And we will also have Dr. Moskos uh, speak at the, another one of our events, which is the uh, first national Hellenic American Genealogy Conference, which is taking place on April 25th. And um, it's a, a fantastic success. People from all over the United States are emailing RSVPs uh, to come to that particular event. Uh, thank you, and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the event like, uh, like I do. Tell me a few words about your book, okay? My name is Peter Moskos, and um, I'm the son of Charles Moskos, who wrote the first two editions of Greek Americans. Um, so this is the third edition, which is a, a pretty complete update since the first edition goes back to um, really the 1970s. Um, so 40 years have passed. Um, unfortunately, my father has also passed. He died in 2008. And for um, years, we were slowly talking about working on the third edition, but it was more talk than work. Um, but I got to serious work on it uh, back in 2011. And um, found out well that the book did need a lot of work, but also, of course, so much has happened in Greek America since the first two editions of the book came out. Um, there are also ways we can do research now um, that simply didn't exist back then. So, a few, uh, basically, a year and a half, two years of hard work, and I'm pleased to have the third edition of Greek Americans. So I'm the chairman of the Education and Cultural Committee of the Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce. And uh, we have uh, all types of events uh, that take place during the year. So we're very happy to, uh, to have tonight uh, Dr. Moskos. Among the events that we're having this year, are, uh, one of them is in the handout that we just gave you. We're going to have the uh, first National Hellenic American Genealogy Conference. Uh, the word is getting out, and uh, people are actually starting to RSVP from all over the United States. Uh, from as far away as, uh, as uh, California. In that particular venue, we're going to have uh, <coughs> Hellenic American genealogists from ar around the country, plus we'll have people that deal with records, in particular uh, yeah, Ellis Island records. We are fortunate to have uh, George Chalos, who's the uh, chief librarian of uh, Ellis Island here with us today. He will be one of our presenters. And we'll also have the uh, Dr. Minotos, uh, who's the head of the archives of the uh, Hellenic National Archives in, in Athens, to also come to the event, and some other speakers. Tonight, though, uh, and I'll go through some other events that we're going to have after the presentation, but tonight uh, uh, we are very happy to have with us uh, uh, Dr. Moskos to speak on the uh, third edition of, uh, of Greek American Struggle and Success. It's the third edition, uh, 
the book when it came out, uh, and to this day, after X amount of years, is one of the classics of Hellenic American history. Uh, it was originally written by his uh, father, uh, Charles Moskos, uh, a legendary figure uh, within the Hellenic American community and, and in research in terms of uh, 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 Hellenic Americans, not only in terms of their history, but also their struggles, their achievements, and a lot of the statistics that were put together. So uh, rather than hear from me discuss the book, it's better to get uh, uh, Peter Moskos in his third edition to present his book to us tonight. Thank you all for coming here. It's, um, I'm impressed that so many of you would. Well, I fear that actually you came here to hear my father and not me, as many of you. Uh, have heard them before, but I've, I've heard wonderful things before this about, um, and I still do, he, he passed away in 2008, um, and it's still always good to hear fond remembrances of him, including similar talks he gave um, in New York and other places, you know, 10 and 20 years ago. So I'm, I'm very happy to follow in his footsteps. Um, before I start, I, I should maybe just mention how this book came to being. Uh, so my father wrote Greek Americans in the late 70s, and it was published in 1980. I was um, nine years old at the time, so I really didn't care at all about it. Um, I do remember there was a big squabble because one of the first editions, the color, um, was red. And I thought, that can't be, that can't be, anyway. That's the only rule, that the cover has to be blue. Is that too much to ask for? Um, when Michael Dukakis, who was kind enough to write the introduction to this edition, when he was running for president, they rushed a second edition, and it was quite rushed, I later found out, but they rushed that into print in 1988. And from there, um, the book sat, and my father continued. He was, a, he was one of the eminent you know, Greek-American academics, which, which I am not. Um, my, I follow very much after him. He was a military sociologist. I, basically became a police sociologist. Um, he, but my field did, did not follow him into um, Greek American studies, and, but he wanted to write the third edition with me, which seemed fair enough, but partly because of my own interests and distractions of getting a PhD, of becoming a police officer, of teaching here at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Um, it never happened, and um, as I like to say, we were slowly not working on it for years before he died. Um, <clears throat> I'd go and visit, and we'd go through boxes of newspaper club, what are we going to do with these? Um, I thought the book had died with my father, um, but thanks to the publisher's transaction books in New Brunswick, um, it, um, they kept nagging me and said, no, we still want you to write it. And uh, so finally in 2011, I got to work mostly because I wanted a Moscow and Moscow's production. Um, but I had a lot to learn, and I, I say in the book, and I say here, I'm probably not the most qualified person to write this book. There are people in this room who have dedicated much more of their lives and careers to this field. Um, but I did the best I could. Um, and um, I, you know, I, I certainly learned a lot in writing this. Um, I seriously, you never know. I didn't think there'd be a third edition. I doubt there will be a fourth edition even more strongly, but you never know. Um, but this edition was sorely needed, I discovered. Um, from the mismatch that was made between the first and second editions of the book, um, to the fact that the first, there was no digital copy of the book. Um, the first edition was on a typewriter. Uh, the second, who knows what happened in the second edition. Um, my father was unable to access things we consider standard now when he wrote the book. There were no computers back then. You couldn't access census data. Um, so the world of research has opened up dramatically, especially in Greek American studies, especially in ethnic studies, where you can, where you can you have access to resources that were completely incomprehensible back then. Um, so I hope my additions to the book have been good. Uh, if you know the first two editions, it is a, um, I would say entirely new, but a heavily new book, um, because you know once you get into it, at some point, um, and I know he would have wanted this, but I felt funny when I did it, but when you might notice I bumped his name from first to second. Um, and that was when I really took ownership of the book and said, now it's the Peter Moscow's and Charles Moscow's book. But I know he would have wanted that anyway, because that's the type of guy, the guy he was. Um, so I was thinking of, Titled in this talk, um, Greek Americans from Christopher Columbus to Yanis Antetokounmpo. Um, and that could raise a few eyebrows on both ends. Um, I don't know which one's odder that there's a Greek basketball, an African American Greek basketball player for the uh, Milwaukee Bucks right now, Yanis Antetokounmpo, 
um, who uh, was born in Greece, in Athens, uh, lived um, as an illegal immigrant to Nigerian parents, and uh, is a rookie um, sensation, and uh, I just learned about him about four days ago, to be honest. I, I'm not a basketball fan, but I said, what kind of name is Yannis Antetokounmpo? And I found out. Um, so he is the latest uh, Greek American, one of the latest Greek Americans. Now the first Greek American is a bit more controversial, um, but if you ask some Greeks, um, they will say the first Greek American was um, Christopher Columbus. Um, and it's not quite as crazy as it sounds. Um, his origins are very vague. Everyone claims him, though. Um, but there is some evidence that he comes from the island of Hios. Even though he may not have been Greek, he might have been a Genevieve nobleman. This was written years ago um, by Seraphine Canutas in his book, Christopher Columbus, a Greek nobleman. Uh, but there's probably a grain of truth to that. If nothing else, if you go to the island of Hios today, there are lots of people who live there who have the last name Columbus, which is a distinctly non-Greek name. Um, but even if one does, kind of, admittedly, I have to say most non-Greek historians do not accept that Christopher Columbus was Greek. But there might have been some Greek, but again, he might have lived in today what is Greece. Um, the first Greek, after Columbus at least, though I do have this image of Columbus landing in what's now Hispanola in the New World when he meets the Indians come and meet him and perhaps there's first some exchange of gifts, but perhaps there's some squabbling, and finally an Indian turns to Christopher Columbus and says, Elinaziste? You're Greek? Um, because there is this idea among Greeks that we're everywhere, um, that no matter where you go, and it's a punchline, there's just many different versions of that joke. I've heard one with American Indians, I've heard it in Beijing, um, but the punchline is always the same, that we're surprised to meet each other um, wherever we go. Effie, where's your Elinaziste joke? <laughs> Um, the first Greek was a, came from the Spanish expedition of um, Panfilo de Navais, though I may be saying that wrong, a man by the name of Don Theodoro, mm. uh, who was a ship's hawker. Navarus um, landed under the Spanish crown in Florida, what is today Florida, and um, I had a fascinating trek over land to Mexico City over the course of many years um, that goes beyond the scope of this talk, but he needed water. And um, the Indians uh, wanted or agreed to give his fleet water, but demanded a hostage in return. Um, Don Theodoro, Volunteer, Theodoro volunteered himself as a hostage. He went ashore um, and was never seen again. Um, presumably, he, they were not Greek. Um, <laughs> So the first steps onto the new world did not go well. Um, the next introduction of Greeks into, into what is now America was the new Smyrna colony in 1763 after Florida passed from Spanish to British hands. Um, about 1,400 people were sent there, indentured servants. Uh, about four or 500 were Greek, from, mostly from the Mani, and it did not go well. Um, after 14 years, there were about 100 Greeks left. Um, there was starvation, deprivation, revolt. Um, but they basically then packed up and moved to St. Augustine, Florida, where they did reasonably well. Um, John Iannopoulos established a school in his house, which is still standing, and it's the oldest uh, school house in America, an old wooden structure in, um, in St. Augustine. And I looked that up today just to make sure that it's still there. <laughs> and. Um, you can't trust everything you read online, but it says the man named who lived there was Juan Genopoli, and they're trying to make him Italian, but I'm sticking with what I know. Uh, but So there, there might be some dispute about his Hellenic origins as well. But the schoolhouse, the old wooden schoolhouse, is still there from the 1760s, probably. Um, this was an era when not, you know, this was not yet Greek America as we know it. Um, another interesting batch of Greeks came over during and after the Greek Civil War from 1821 to 1827. The um, 40 orphans that were bought by, um, I forget which denomination it was, but they were brought over uh, to, but they were not Greek Orthodox, uh, to New England to be educated and spread the word, and they did amazingly well. Um, a few returned to, Greek, to Greece, as sort of was the original plan, but many stayed here um, in America. You have a professor of Greek at Harvard University out of that group. Um, uh, uh, professor Sophocles, that's a good name. Uh, you have an educational pioneer, Zakos, 
among blacks after the Civil War and an early proponent of equal education for women. Uh, you have the first U.S. representative, the first Greek-American U.S. representative, Miltiades Miller, U.S. representative from Wisconsin in 18, their present condition. If in 10 years the world will learn to fly, the Greeks will still crawl around, not even trying to find a new way of progressing themselves. And you may wonder, why is the Greek paper so damn upset? Well, it goes on. Did you go to the community picnic last Sunday? You did? Good. When you were coming home on the train, what did you think? That it sounded like a train full of squealing pigs. That's right, we felt the same way. So I'm glad someone's keeping up standards here. Um, as a little side note, it's not a major path of Greek immigration, but I do want to mention Tarpon Springs, Florida, because it has the, um, though it had a population of about only 2,500 Greeks, um, it was the only town that was majority Greek. Um, sponge diving fame, but the population was only 3,400. Um, so it wasn't simply a Greek town, it was in fact a Greek town. The Greek population there is, is the same in numbers, but of course now the city of Tarpon Springs is much, much larger. So when these Greeks came to America, um, they usually looked for some sense of familiarity in homeland, and often these were found in um, the Topica Somatia, the, the community organizations um, centered usually around a village or an island, sometimes a region, um, in which, you know, in my mind, Greek men get together, play cards, drink coffee, and watch soccer on TV. Uh, but I'm sure in the 20th century, they had a much more important, it was, you know, it was, the, it was the only link you had to your homeland. It was how you networked. It was how you found your bride, perhaps. Um, these organizations were the most Greek of the Greek organizations, because at this point, many Greeks felt that they were going to go back to Greece. I mean, they saw themselves not as Greek Americans, they saw themselves as Greek, and we don't know how many went back. Um, and there was, you could go back, there was much back and forth often, and we only know the numbers, and we don't know very well, the numbers of people who came in, we don't know at all the numbers of people who left, but it's the Topica Somatias that, that really sort of kept the spirit of Greece alive in America, because everyone knows your village compared to the next one in your village, the oranges are, are juicier and the water is sweeter. And, and the air is fresher than, you know, on the other side of that mountain. Um, but if you go through these organizations, you really get a roster list of, uh, of, of Greek geography. Um, one of note, the Chatista Society, which is um, what my grandfather was part of, um, the Chatista, Chatista Society, which is today, it's in northern Ipiros today, southern Albania, um, in 1911, they raised $15,000, which is about $350,000 in today's funds, to buy their village from the heirs of Ali Pasha. Um, and the Chicago Saloniki newspaper reported that when the paper was complete and the village had become property of its inhabitants, the proud Chatistiani merrily celebrated their redemption of their native town from the descendants of a bloodthirsty alien. The language of those papers, I just love it. Um, more in an assimilation standpoint is AHEPA, the American Hellenic Educational Progressive Association, um, which was founded in 1922. Um, AHEPA, and I have here my grandfather's AHEPA hat. <laughs> they, they say they don't really encourage the, the Fezzi anymore, but I'm kind of partial to it, and it fits me well. I believe this is from the 30s. Um, so a HEPA found was formed with um, sort of Masonic uh, imitation um, and was seen by many Greek immigrants, including my grandfather, as uh, a way to become American, um, just like the Masons, but you know, for us Greeks. Um, a HEPA very quickly moved their headquarters. Um, I see my colleague there taking pictures of me. This will come back to haunt me. Um, they moved their headquarters to Washington, D.C., and their, you know, the first word was American Hellenic. It was very, um, originally they started as a completely assimilated organization. They backed off that a little bit, but became the more American organization compared to um, GAPA, the Greek American Progressive Association, which is no longer around, but the GAPA was much more Greek, and they did Greek folk dances and spoke Greek, or Ahepa, and, you know, they danced waltzes and foxtrots at their conventions. Um, and encouraged uh, a very American focus in, um, in the Greek American community. Um, and I have an a president in 1925 sort of finally said the unthinkable, which is that today 90% of our compatriots have definitely decided to remain in America permanently. 
They are fast becoming American citizens, establishing American culture, homes, businesses, rearing their children to be real Americans. This is the country where they will die, the country where their children will live. So this is in the 1920s. Again, immigration had largely um, been cut off at this point, um, and the Greeks were, you know, by and large, as a group, making it. Um, Ahepa peaked with around 40,000 members, probably. Um, Today it's down to about 16,000 from 20,000 in the late 1980s. Um, it has a limited appeal to youth, um, so it's questionable whether uh, you know, the long-term viability of the HEPA to, as representing and maintaining Greek American culture is questionable of how, how dominant that will be in the future. Um, the great with, when the doors of immigration closed, um, what you basically saw was a shift from the diaspora model of immigration to um, the American ethnic model. Um, the diaspora model states, and, if, and one city, uh, you know, with the Alexandria, Egypt, in the 20, early 20th century would exemplify this, where Greeks went, they lived, they died, they had kids, but they identified as Greek. Um, they had their own community, very much in sort of a colony form. And, you know, it went on for you know decades, if not centuries, and in some cases millennia. Um, but it was very much they saw themselves as Greek. Um, yes, it was their homeland, but it was also a foreign land, um, and it maintained that concept. And you see that very much in the early Greeks who came to America. But over the in the 1920s, as immigration stopped, we moved to the American ethnic model, which is the hyphenated, you're not Greek American. Um, keep in mind, too, that Greek patriotism was not a given, as especially if you live in some Greek community or just there for the money. Um, something like 30,000 Greeks returned to fight in the Balkan Wars. Um, we don't know how many of those returned, uh, but there's certainly, we don't, it's not very, it's not a given that those very early Greeks considered themselves Greek Americans. They were Greek. Um, so this changed over the following few decades. You know, that's what I guess kids do to you. I think that's, that's probably the single greatest reason. A 1930 survey of 24 nationalities showed that Greeks were last in an acquisition of American citizenship, holding length of time in America constant. But still you have this transition. Uh, but what you get in terms of immigration is a policy that limited Greek immigrants to 100 a year. Um, you were able to buy into the future a bit, but the doors were for a large part closed until 1940 uh, when you had provisions for displaced persons and also some family re reunification so the Greeks came again uh, into American life. Greek immig immigration stopped again uh, basically after 1981 with Greeks' ascension into the European community, now the European Union. Um, for many reasons, uh, partly until recently an improving economic situation in Greece until 2009, 2010 kept Greeks in Greece more likely. Um, America has very difficult visa requirements, shamefully to Greeks, uh, which they don't have in other countries. And with a European passport, you can simply go to London or Germany. Um, so we've made it harder for Greeks to come to this country and again, the past few years excluded, by and large there's been less push from Greece over the past few decades. Um, there was also a significant number of Greeks, which shouldn't be forgotten in the 60s um, up through the 70s, um, that jumped ship in America, often in ports like Newark and Baltimore. Um, by one account, um, 30,000 Greek nationals uh, entered America that way by just hopping off ships and, and staying. Um, contrasted with the distant second place in nationality of 13,000 Chinese who did the same during the same period. Um, one Greek ship jumper put it as follows, each of us has two nightmares, one that he will die here in America, the other is that he will get caught by immigration authorities and sent home to die in Greece. Um, those are the examples. Um, so during this, the last phase of Greek immigration, the big second wave in the 60s and 70s, um, you also have what I say we, but maybe it's my generation, but we associate now with Greek Americans. One is not just Greeks in the restaurant business, but Greek restaurants. Um, in 1960, in the late 60s, there was one Greek restaurant in all of Chicago. Um, by 1978, there were 20 some, and that number has held constant since then. Um, you see similar, uh, the idea of 
similar, similar trends in other cities, such as New York. Um, you also have the formation of new Greek towns. Astoria became Greek during this era, or as Greek as it is, as, as, as it has ever been. Chicago also had a new Greek town, which has since disappeared on the north side. Um, but this was a second wave, and there was some conflict between these two generations, these two groups of immigrants, in part because the newer immigrants tended to be, um, they tended to be better educated, they were often more urban, and they were often shocked to come here and find um, basically a perfect facsimile of a 1930 village in the Peloponnese from their older generation. Um, a lot can be made of these differences. Also, the immigrants tended to be more liberal than, they, than the previous generation politically. Um, but since that time, it's safe to say that those distinctions have all but, but disappeared um, into one larger Greek-American community. Um, in New York, you also saw Greeks dominating taxi cab companies. Um, and hot chestnuts, I read, had disappeared for many decades before being revived by Greeks here in New York. I wish I liked them more, I don't. But, um, so where do we stand today? Um, Traditionally, Greek identity has been seen as some combination of held through the church, through faith, through family, through language, and through the homeland. And certainly, um, the church is deceiving in importance in, in the, not in all Greek Americans' life, but in the Greek American community as a whole. Um, connections to the homeland are certainly um, lessening overall, um, as is Greek language. Um, Naturally, generations born in America are much less likely to speak uh, Greek. But it does raise an interesting question. Between 1970 and today, the number of people who claim to have Greek descent, Greek origins, Greek, you might say Greek Americans, has increased to 1.2 million Greeks in 1970. Something like half, check, something like half that. Where are these Greeks coming from? They're not coming from Greece. We're not having kids. Um, and what it seems to be is that the bane of assimilation, the intermarriage, seems to be, if anything, growing the Greek American community. Um, and this is, for the, you know, since the first Greeks came here, the assimilation was feared, learning English was feared. Um, anyone who promotes an old school attitude that you have to, you know, speak Greek. Um, you have to have a, it's a lost cause. It's just, that's not, that's not going to happen with the next generation. But the number of people identifying as Greek is increasing. Um, and to some extent, I serve as a good example of this. Um, it's a concept that I call Trump identity. And quite simply, if you are Greek and something else, you tend to claim Greek first. Um, my father was born in Chicago. His Parents came, were born Ottoman subjects. Uh, it sounds so exotic, I love saying that. Um, in what today is Albania. Um, until recently, no one in my family has ever lived in Greece proper, ever, um, or had a Greek passport. Um, and yet, and my mother was born in Germany, and she came to America as an immigrant and still has a slight German accent. Um, and yet, I always say I'm Greek, I never say I'm German. Why would I want to be German? Um, I should say, though, that my mom speaks Greek better than me or my father ever did. Um, she has become Greek-American. There are many cases of, and this, of course, doesn't get counted on the census, the, um, the priest of the Greek church in Albuquerque, where my father was raised and my wife is from, is a American-born, a non-Greek, a convert. Is he not Greek-American? Of course he is. Um, some prominent Greek authors, Mary Rubellis, who's written you know, fabulous books on Greek America, for married into the Greek world. Um, the man who taught me Greek at Princeton, Richard Burgi. Um, no one could be more Greek. Um, he passed away a few years ago, unfortunately, but of course he was with his name. He was Irish and German. Um, so you have these contributions in some ways, and this is, goes back to that fine basketball player, Anita Kumbo. Um, and his name is, is great because so he only became a, a Greek citizen a couple of years ago, because once he was successful, because the Greeks aren't too good to Nigerian immigrants. Um, and they changed the spelling of his name from a very phonetic Latin letters to the Greek, and now the English comes from that. So it's got the NT, it's got the MP, it looks fabulous in English, but it makes no sense unless you speak a little Greek. Um, but I got distracted by Anna Um 
Where was I? Where was I? Someone help me out here. Ah, the Greek American. Yes, yeah, so my, my mother's German, my father's Greek, and I call myself Greek. So I looked, I, this is some of the research that I was able to do with Trump identity. If you are Greek, right now more than half of all Greeks, people of Greek descent in America, are Greek and something else. That's what intermarriage has done. Um, but I simply assumed that the census allows you to put two ethnicities down. And I figure what you put first is the one you value more. And you do things like keep track of alphabetization. There's some, you know, it gets a little fancier than that. But it turns out, and not too surprisingly, that Greeks claim Greek identity first more than any other ethnicity. With one exception, we're tied with Italians. That's 50-50. But Italians and Greeks do have a lot in common. That's in a way isn't surprising. If you want a, an extreme example, if you are of Belgian and Greek descent, um, you are 70, 80 percent more likely to say you are Greek than Belgian than Belgian than Greek. But of course, even Belgians and Belgian don't have a lot of Belgian identity. So, but that's sort of an extreme example. Um, but Greek identity trumps every other single identity out there. So, an open question, and I'll propose some answers, but I don't know the answer is why is that? Um, and I can look to myself for that bit, saying, well, partly there's no downside to being Greek. Um, certainly not anymore. Um, Greeks have largely been successful. If you look at household incomes, Greeks earn 30% more than non-Greeks. It's a huge difference. Um, and that's, a con that's remained consistent for the past four and a half decades, a 30% increase. Even if you just look at white households in America, uh, Greeks maintain a 22% uh, advantage over non-Greeks. Um, we, so, Greeks are more highly educated than any other groups. Greeks have recently been, um, and of course now you start mixing race and ethnicity, but Asian Americans have now exceeded Greeks in college uh, graduation rates. And Jewish Americans, so it's harder to tell because the census doesn't ask about religion, Jewish Americans tend, uh, especially European Jews, tend to be wealthier than Greeks. Um, but by almost any standards, Greeks have really sort of come on top. We're fighting above our weight. Um, to put this in perspective, there are more Welsh Americans than Greek Americans, um, and yet you rarely hear about the Welsh. Um, though they have good men's choirs, so maybe you do hear about them, I don't know. Um, the American perception over the past hundred years of Greeks in America has gone from Oriental and swarthy to white. Um, we've gone from religiously misunderstood to mainstream Christian. Uh, we've gone from immigrants who threatened American values to being an essential representation of those values. While early arrivals stood together because they had to, because they <coughs> faced prejudice, because they didn't speak English, um, today xenophobia is more focused on Mexicans, uh, religious bigotry is more focused on Muslims, um, and we don't have the need to stand together. We don't, it's not necessary anymore for our protection, so it has become more an ethnicity of choice. Um, I don't have to tell people I'm Greek, so it's really hard not to. Um, but we can use it to our advantage when it suits us, and it has suited, it has helped me many times in life being Greek. It's never, I can't think of any time it's hurt me. Um, certainly while traveling. I was thinking it's interesting, the only time, there's one place in the world where speaking bad Greek doesn't help you, and that's Astoria. Because I'm just another Malakas who speaks bad Greek. We're, we're, we're everywhere. Um, everywhere else in the world, my Greek opens doors for me um, just because I try and you know, I have some functional level of it. Um, Greek communities, though, have largely dispersed to the suburbs, certainly in Chicago. Um, there's still you know, the largest concentrations of Greek are in New England, New York, um, and Chicago. But the only Greek town that's left um, in America. <clears throat> would be Astoria, but most residents of Astoria, and I've asked, it's where I live, it's where I live um, don't think of it as a Greek neighborhood. You know, so there are probably about 15,000 Greeks, maybe 10% of the total population of Astoria is in Greek. So if you're looking for it, it's there, but if you move there now, uh, many people are unaware uh, because there's so many other ethnicities. Um, Chicago's Greek town is um, some very good restaurants. Flaming Saganaki was invented in one of them. Um, but Greeks have not lived there for the past 40 years. Um, Baltimore, of all cities, uh, where I lived for a while, has a very small um, but still barely alive Greek town. Um, but almost every other city in the world um, no longer has a, a condensed Greek community. And that, in, uh, Toronto, I'm sorry, does. Uh, but even places that are associated with a lot of Greeks, like Melbourne, um, it's all spread out to the suburbs. There's no, there, there's no 
Greek center left in those towns, except for perhaps a restaurant and, of course, um, whatever Greek Orthodox church exists. Um, so you have Greeks now as, to some extent, an optional identity, um, to some extent a choice identity, um, and I think this is because the Greek ethnicity in America has become, has gone through, I think, a couple distinct um, acculturations into American mainstream. Um, when Zach Galifianakis, the comedian, his uncle was um, ran for senator against Jesse Helms, and Jesse Helms released a slogan that said, um, "Vote for Jesse. He's one of us." Um, and Jesse won. Um, Nick Galifianakis, by the way, was oh, that was the uncle uh, Zach, the comedian. Um, Someone asked if he's ever been pressured into changing his name, and he said that he already has. His, his real name is Chad Farthouse. Um, but you have a normalization of Greek names. Um, and if any single person had most to do with that, it was probably Michael Dukakis and his run for presidency. During the course of his failed bid, um, he used his Greek identity to, he said it, was, it turned out to help him. Um, it was seen as a representation of American values um, rather than this exotic other that it had been even just a few generations before. Um, Paul Sarbanes, former senator from Maryland, um, estimated that he raised 25% of his money on his first run from Greek Americans. Um, partly because of the relatively small side of Greek America, um, there's no Greek American block that is worth anything to a politician. But what this allows is Greeks to give money to Greek politicians no matter their political views. And Paul Sangas, the late a congressman from Massachusetts, uh, recalled getting money from a Greek restaurant here, and he said, don't you want to know what he stand for? He said, no, I don't want to know what you stand for because I won't give you my money. Um, and this is a repeated theme among Greek American politicians, but it is, it's, it's done two things. It's allowed Greeks to exceed in the political sphere beyond their numbers, it also has misrepresented the Greek American community in large part because the Greek politicians have generally been Democrats and far more liberal than the Greek American community overall. Um, so you get those two things. Um, I also think that a very important feature in the Greek American world was my big fat Greek wedding um, as a normalization of the Greek experience. Of course, when it came out, the first Greek, I, we want to know, is it good for the Greeks? What, Remember, Greeks didn't like never on Sunday when it came out either, because it showed a good time. We don't do that. But then once it's successful, we embrace it, and we come around, and we say, isn't that fabulous? Um, my father, who taught a very large class at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois, um, said that when that movie came out, um, countless students, immigrants, non-Greeks, came up to him and said, um, you know, this is our story. Um, and it allowed immigrant groups to realize that that immigrant story is the American story. Um, the New Hellenic Museum in Chicago um, says, I think a little bit with a wink, but uh, says this is not a Greek museum, it's an American museum that happens to be Greek. Well, we'll see. I wonder how many non-Greeks go there. Um, but this idea that we, that, they, that we are no longer a different group, that we represent the best, um, on a good day at least, we represent the best of what America has to offer. Um, What's also, we saw to my big fat Greek wedding was people coming up and saying, you know, is your family like that? And the answer is usually not really to somewhat. Um, but it was said with a certain sense of envy um, because the alternative, the Waspy family was the family that doesn't communicate, the family that doesn't hug and kiss, the family that doesn't say they love you, the family that puts their parents in, you know, the old folks in the nursing homes, um, where the Greek family was all big one jumbled mess. Um, and this is something that Americans seem to miss. I mean, of course, it's not, you know, none of it. These are all stereotypes. But if we're going to be stereotyped, at least they're good ones. Um, and this is part of the reason I think the Greek population has grown. I should note that since the economic crisis in Greece, the number of Americans who identify Greek ancestry has gone down. Um, but it's remained stable since that point. Uh, so there were some very fair weather Greeks that I'm not putting that down anymore. Uh, but we're currently it's about 1.2 million, which yes, counts some people that don't consider themselves Greeks, but also undercounts others who do but don't have, have Greek ancestry. So the future for Greek America is, let me put it this way, the second edition of Greek Americans in 1988 ended up on a slightly pessimistic note. 
um, because it was seen that the Greek American community was slowly going to wither and disappear. Um, it's changed, it may be less strong. The traditional foundations of Greek America are probably decreasing in importance, certainly as a percentage of the overall community. But the self-identity as Greek Americans, which may run less deep, which you may be able to not tell people if things aren't going in your favor, but continues to grow, and I think that will continue to grow as long as the Greek American community collectively remains something to be proud of. And that these are people who don't speak Greek. These are people, like myself, third generation Greek American. Um, these are people who don't go to church. Um, yes, in some ways it is a lighter version based on food and family. Um, but in a way, that's all we got. Um, if we discount that, if we say you're not real Greek, um, we're basically discounting the future of Greek America. So in some ways, I think we as Greek Americans have to think of how do you build on that. Um, yes, of course, you want to encourage the traditional ties, but we have to understand that the, uh, you know, of the 1.2 self-identified Greek Americans, um, very few of them meet that traditional definition. But the good news, for whatever reason, is um, we still are alive and well through intermarriage, through Trump identity, through welcoming other people into our community. Um, and of course, there's some notable exceptions to that politically in Greece. But historically, um, both in Greece and in America, Greeks have been, not all of them, but have been a very open ethnos um, and have welcomed other people into the community, whether it is a Nigerian Greek basketball player or whether it is my mother. Um, are considered equally Greek American. I would like to think, and to end on a sort of optimistic note, that it is that feeling of inclusiveness, um, that, that sort of dedication to doing good and to, and, and to helping others is, is really what makes uh, Greek American strong, and hopefully, even without fresh blood coming from Greece, will we'll continue to thrive. So, thank you very much. went into some very, very interesting areas, and um, I'm proud of him, actually. You know, he's younger than I am, and some of the people who were the greats, okay, of the past are, are no longer with us. For example, his father, for example, Salutos, he, he mentioned uh, Canutus. Um, you know, even Contopoulos, uh, who died as a young man and uh, after finishing his PhD and what, wrote what I thought was one of the uh, greatest uh, histories of Hellenic Americans, in his particular case, uh, Hellenic Americans uh, in New York City up to, up to 19, uh, 1910. But the reason why I'm proud of him is because, as I said, uh, there's not that many around today. And now we have someone who's, who's the future the future, so please give him a hand, a hand. He is the future, and um, a lot of things have, have, have passed, and, and we have to resurrect those particular things. Just like he mentioned that, uh, for, for whatever reason, the Greek population doubled, uh, we, we have to actually uh, pick up that mantle, that light, uh, to continue uh, what, uh, what uh, Professor Moskos is, is talking about. Because things have disappeared. For example, the Journal of Hellenic Diaspora, okay, which was a fantastic journal, which your father wrote in, which the Ludus wrote in, which uh, Dan Georgiakis wrote in, and many other uh, intellectuals, no longer exists. So this is one of the things, uh, like Professor Moskos was talking about, where we, we take the mantle, you know, the new generation takes the mantle, and in fact resurrects those particular things. Let me say a few things about, uh, about the Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce. So we have the president here, Nancy Copriwano, who's, who's sitting here. Uh, the, chamber, the chamber does a lot of different events, okay? a lot of different events, and you'll be hearing about some of them, including the cultural events. We specifically, and as a rule, do not charge anyone for any of the events that we have, the educational events. But there are costs. For example, we don't get uh, this particular hall for nothing. Uh, so, but, but we have dedicated people in various uh, committees in the chamber who are in fact subsidizing these type of events and will continue to do that. Some of the events that will be coming up, as I mentioned, is, uh, and it relates basically to what Professor Moskos was talking about, uh, the, the first National Hellenic American Genealogy Conference. Never happened before anywhere in the world, by the way. Uh, 
But the reason why I bring it up is it relates to uh, Professor Moskos's uh, comment about people uh, all of a sudden uh, relating to being Greek. There are people, for example, in the Hellenic American genealogy uh, field that are asking uh, questions about their genealogy, and many of them, maybe their great grandfather was, uh, you know, was Greek, and, and the only one that was Greek, by the way, and all of a sudden they're associating with these. Uh, particular things. So, for example, uh, Stamanti, who's our executive um, uh, director, is, has been getting RSVPs from around the country, many people with non-Greek names, but they're very excited about uh, going to the conference. Among some of the events that uh, also are coming is this is the 50th anniversary of the Selma marches. This is the 10th anniversary of the death of Archbishop Yakovos, and this is also uh, in April. Uh, you know, uh, again, when he became the Archbishop in 1959. So one of the other uh, things that we're doing besides the genealogy conference is we're having the Archbishop Yakovos uh, anniversary um, musical tribute. And this musical tribute will not uh, just be a, a Hellenic American type of an event, but it will be a multicultural event. So, for example, we're going to invite the African American community to partake in it and other communities. Among the things that we do also is, uh, is support uh, people of, of our community with, that perhaps maybe have a different religion. For example, uh, our committee has in fact supported the uh, Jewish Museum in Athens. Uh, we did raise uh, in some of our other activities and other committees money for the Jewish Museum. Uh, for example, we are donating $5,000 to the Jewish, uh, Jewish Museum in Athens. And we're going to continue those great works. What are we asking from you? What we're asking from you is if you have the time to think about joining the uh, Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce. We do a lot of different things. We are a Chamber of Commerce, but we're also very into the um, educational, cultural side, and we're going to continue to expand that. I would like to now introduce our president, uh, Nancy Papuana, to say a few words for us. Uh, she is the first. Uh, female president of the Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce. We're so proud of her, Nancy. Thank you very much all for being here tonight with us. But um, I can tell you how important is what we heard today. And I would like to thank very much uh, Professor Moskos and of course our Executive Vice President Hukachos and all the team of the Hellenic American Chamber of Commerce that gathered together to create those beautiful events that I hope you enjoy listening and participating. Thank you very much all. I, I will just uh, close with a couple of words before uh, you, know, you guys jump on uh, uh, Professor Moskos and basically asking your questions and uh, pick up his books. Um, uh, Columbus was correct. Okay, Christopher, uh, Christopher Columbus was Greek. There's no, there's no doubt about it in, in my mind. Uh, when you think of Genoa, you know, they say he was from Genoa or what have you. Don't forget that the Chios at the time was uh, under the control of Genoa. Uh, Christopher Columbus wrote his name in the Hellenic. He didn't write his name in, in some other things. And Christopher Columbus spoke about only one relative that he had, and that relative was a pirate, a French pirate actually. By French, I mean. He, uh, he was in the French waters. He was, in fact, Greek. His name was Paleologos, and that was the relative that he said was his relative. So, uh, to end the conversation, he <laughs> Thank you all. Yeah, if I can uh, mention, um, the, not only is my book for sale back there, um, which I urge you to buy, I actually have three books. They're all back there. Um, but I also have, because I found a cache of um, t a half dozen or so original um, uh, Salutis books. Um, first edition from 196, I forget when. Um, and not only that, but I'd also like to point out that charming uh, woman back there selling the book is my cousin, Aldo Mosco, who, um, how's it, our grandparents were, si I always get this wrong. Um, but. But she is part, as I mentioned, of the sort of the story that is yet to be told of um, the Greek Albanian American uh, side of my family, um, and it's always a treat to, to see. Pick up those books, get the signature, support the cause.
MGTV USA. Οι δραστηριότητες της ελληνοαμερικανικής κοινότητας με βίντεο και πλήρες ρεπορτάζ. Επισκεφτείτε την ιστοσελίδα μας mgtvusa.com Καλύπτουμε καθημερινά τα γεγονότα στην ομογένεια. Επίσης, αναλαμβάνουμε την κάλυψη των εκδηλώσεών σας, γάμους, βαπτίσεις, παραγωγές διαφημίσεων, ντοκιμαντέρ. Τηλεφωνήστε μας στο 718-908-8729 ή επισκεφτείτε μας στο διαδίκτυο mgtvusa.com